That's my cue. This meeting is being recorded. Good morning, yeah. everybody. Um, uh, my name is Tony Santa Ana, uh, and I'm very, very honored to be with you all today. Um, I just want to acknowledge that there's so much going on in this world right now from uh, from the pandemic, uh, you know, the COVID-19 pandemic to the wildfires, to the air quality, to the elections, to uh, so many things happening, taking care of aging parents, uh, homeschooling children. So I acknowledge all of that. Um, and I just want to say thank you for being here. Um, it's important. Um, as a classified professional myself, proudly, I, I just want to make sure I'm in community with all of you. Uh, so thank you very much to Cyrus, Estela, uh, and all the professional development community members who brought myself um, and Allied Path uh, Consulting here to be with you today. So thank you very much. Um, before I begin, I was wondering, um, I'm not sure how many people are returnees. Uh, it, can you put that in the chat and also, you know, just put your name in the chat and put, you know, your position so people know who you are. Uh, but just let me know also if you are a returnee or if you're brand new, because I'm going to be going over content review. Um, so I just want to make sure how much I should uh, go into content review. If there's many of you that are new, um, I can maybe go a little bit more in depth. But if, uh, if a lot of you are, you know, you came back and then um, I could just uh, kind of just do a little bit of a brief overview. So thank you very much for that as I look at the chat right now. And uh, in terms of engagement, um, I definitely love engagement. Uh, I know it's a two hour slot, so I wanna make sure that, that this two hours is, it isn't feel like it's dragging. So please engage with the chat. If you have any questions, uh, let Cyrus know and uh, we can stop and pause. Um, so just wanna make sure. Yeah, so we got returning, returning. Most of you are returning, great. Okay, great. Returning, returning, okay, great. All right, most of you seems like, okay, there's one new I seen. Welcome, Diane. Watanabe, thank you. Okay, perfect, perfect. All right. Okay, all right. So it seems like most of you are returning, so I appreciate that. Thank you for coming back. I guess I did something right, so <laughs> I appreciate you uh, coming back. All right, so what we're gonna do now uh, is we're gonna do some mindfulness just to really ground ourselves and uh, for many of you who were here last week, uh, we did a, like a five minute grounding. Um, and I really like this picture. Uh, is your mind full or are you mindful? Uh, so it's really nice to, to kind of give me a visual of um, what we're looking for. Um, so for those of you, uh, you can, you can um, mute your video if you like to get a little bit more privacy. Uh, and I, for those of you, if you haven't did this practice or, or are still new to it, uh, I suggest you put your foot, your feet on the ground, plant it on the ground like their roots, and uh, sit, sit uh, on your tailbone and have your back really straight. Uh, pretend somebody is kind of like pulling your head up so it's very straight. So you can have a lot of airway because that's the most important part is your breath. And so, um, and so I am, this is my signal to bring you back. So I don't know if you can hear it with my headphones. Can you hear that, Cyrus? Yeah? Yes, okay, great. So that's my signal to bring you back, my invite, invite you back. Um, but this will be a guided, uh, guided mindfulness activity. Uh, so again, plant your feet like their roots, back straight. And uh, for your hands, you can put it either uh, facing up or you can have them facing down on your lap, okay? So the first thing I want you to do is I want you to breathe in, big breath in, then breathe out. Breathe in, breathe out, breathe in, breathe out. If you haven't closed your eyes yet, I invite you to close your eyes. Breathe in, breathe out. Keep breathing on your own. Pay attention to your body, to your feet, to your calves, to your knees. What are you feeling? Are you feeling a sensation, tingling, pain? 
pay attention to your back, your stomach, your fingers, your arms, your shoulders. What does it feel like? Pay attention to your head, your eyes, your ears. Breathe in, breathe out, breathe in, breathe out. What's coming up for you in your thoughts? What does it look like? What does it feel like? What does it taste like? How does it sound? Observe it. Say thank you. Thank you to those thoughts. Now I want you to think about a student a student you have worked with at Santa Monica College, a student that has impacted yourself, has reached out to you for support, who keeps coming back to you to talk. What do they look like? What did they say to you? What do they ask for? I want you to think about how you responded to them. How did you make them feel? When was the last time you spoke to them? Breathe in. Breathe out. Breathe in. Breathe out. Breathe in. Breathe out. I invite you to gently open your eyes, wiggle your feet, move your legs, shake out your fingers. And come back. Thank you, thank you, thank you very much for participating in that. I hope you were able to um, get a quick five minute mindfulness um, meditation in there and, and hope it was very fruitful and engaging. And I know there was lots of emotions maybe coming up. We're working with students, for those of you who, who've worked with many students. Um, so thank you for that. Um, you can put in the chat, um, like how you felt about it, 
uh, or if you want to unmute, you can also do that as well. So. Okay, well, thank you very much um, for, for doing that. That's one of our first of our activities uh, for the day. And uh, let me go over the agenda for all of you. So the agenda for today, we're going to be together for about two hours. Um, and um, well, I'm seeing some things in the chat. So thank you. Relaxed, pleasant, calm, grounding. Thank you. Yes. And please, if you do this on your own as well, uh, amazing. Please do this. It, it, that little five minutes could shift the way you think and, you know, energies of how you're working and um, working from home. I think that could be a, very helpful. Um, going back to the agenda, uh, we just did mindfulness. We'll do a check-in. Uh, we'll do a pair share uh, to go over some things. We'll do some content review about what we did last, uh, last week. And then we'll take a break. Um, and then I'm going to introduce uh, equity mindedness um, from the Q Institute. And then we are going to talk about student stories during COVID-19 pandemic. We have a, we have a actually guest speaker who's going to come in for like five minutes or so, Hannah from the IR office, who's going to talk about the study that she conducted, her office studied uh, about the student stories. Um, and we're, gonna, we're actually going to hear and listen and, and analyze and really see and feel what this is going through during this time. And then we're going to do an activity with that. And then we're going to do some closing reflections and appreciations. Um, perfect. Thank you. Um, and for those of you who are new, um, and for those of you who are returning, thank you for listening to me briefly. Uh, but for those of you new, I'm going to introduce myself. My name is Tony Santa Ana. Um, and these are just some pictures that kind of resemble me. Um, I identify as Filipino or Filipinx American. Both of my parents from the Philippines, but I was, I was born in San Francisco and raised in San Jose, California. Um, and uh, I actually am a product of public, school, public education. I went to all the public schools. I actually am a community college graduate. Uh, it took me three years to graduate. Um, I was one of those students who wasn't on that two-year track, but uh, it took me a little bit longer. Finished my uh, bachelor's at San Jose State, got my master's at University of San Francisco, and now finishing my doctorate at University of San Francisco. And as I finished my, my, my master's degree, I, I decided to travel around the world. Um, and I ended up traveling around the world and then being abroad for about 10 years, living in Tokyo, Japan for about six of those years. And coming back to, uh, to San Jose because my parents are aging. And so I really wanted to be with them and take care of them. Um, and so uh, with that, I said, okay, I'll take care of my parents, but I also needed to get a job. And so I ended up going back to my alma mater, De Anza College, where um, I was teaching Asian American studies and ethnic studies. And then uh, adjunct, adjunct life uh, is very, very hard in terms of financially living in the Bay Area. So I had to find another um, a gig to, to, to sustain my life. So I ended up working at the program, as a program coordinator at the Office of Equity, Social Justice, and Multicultural Education as a program coordinator. Um, and I've been doing that for the last five years. And, um, and then I also consult with Allied Path Consulting um, with Dr. Veronica Kiefer Lewis, who is our fearless leader. Um, and our whole goal with Allied Path Consulting is, is equi uh, having an equitized world. Uh, we really want to make sure that people, uh, we create spaces where people feel authentic, feel they're valued, and they're honored. So a little bit about me. Um, and quickly, that's my, uh, that's my newborn baby, uh, five weeks old, um, and Namilin Santa Ana, and then I'm a Golden State Warriors fan, but I know the NBA Finals are here, so you got the Miami Heat and the Lakers, so I'm excited about that. And then uh, I'm a part of an artist collective called Get Free of, you know, just different various artists, um, and I, I, I personally, you know, perform and do poetry and so on, so I've been doing that for a while. Okay, so enough about me. Uh, we're going to do a quick checking question with your uh, with your colleagues and uh, let me put this in the chat so make sure you have that first um, let me see here this in the chat okay. this in the chat here here's the instructions for everybody so for those of you who aren't familiar just please cut and paste that uh, if you need that because in the breakout rooms I don't know if the chat has these questions, but these are your questions. I'm going to do a breakout room. Uh, please accept, and, and then also, if you need some um, help, you can hit the question mark button at the bottom of your screen when you join the breakout room. But the four questions are: What is your name? What is your position at Santa Monica College? 
and how are you doing during this time? And, you know, many of you, there's a lot of things going on and you could please, please share what you feel comfortable. And then what were some reflections um, about last session? Um, like uh, for those that are returning, what, what came up for you? Were there any uh, poignant um, things that you felt like, oh, I wanted to explore more. I had some questions. Um, I really am interested in this. And for those of you who are new, um, please ask some questions from your partner about what they, what they experience um, to just catch you up. Uh, but those are the four questions and um, we'll do this for about f five minutes or so. And again, for those of you who are, um, who are new, the way I did last time is if your birthday is in January 1st, that's the person who will go first. So it's easier to decide who's gonna go first. So if you're January 2nd, I guess you're going first, unless you're January 1st. Uh, but, uh, but that's how you'll decide. I'll put you in a, a group of uh, pair, uh, pair. So let's do that now. I need to stop share to make, uh, okay. so right, breakout rooms. Okay. Okay, how many participants? There's 27, so let's do 13. 13 rooms, I think it's good. Okay, so I'm gonna create the breakout rooms now. Please cut and paste the questions if you need them and enjoy and i'll bring you back in about five minutes uh or so but just make sure mindful of uh your speaking time just because i want to make sure people both get their time to talk all right all right here you go Hi, Olga. All you need to do is just uh, click join and then you'll be in break. Oh, there you go. Um, hi, Olga. If all you need to do is just click join and then you'll be, um, you'll be sent to the breakout room. Olga, are you there? Hi, Olga. Hi, Fariba, how are you? How you doing, Fariba? I'm doing good, how are you? Good, good to hear your voice. I'm gonna send you to a breakout room, okay? With, uh, um, so just please click join, all right? Good morning. All right, Fariba? Okay. All right, here we That's go. Fine. All right, okay. I'm gonna send bye you bye. to breakout room four. Okay, here we go. There awesome. Go. All right, enjoy. Olga, whenever you're ready, I can send you to a breakout room, but I think we're going to be coming back in a couple minutes or so. Uh, so.
Hi, right, welcome back. Pa Paige, is that how you say your name? You're, you're on mute. I accidentally clicked return to meeting when we were in the session. Um, so I feel bad. I just like abandoned. <laughs> no <Bella>. worries. <laughs> no worries. You could, you could send them a chat and just say, sorry, I just clicked it. No worries. Yeah, I might have to. Yeah. Thanks. I'm going to turn off my video for a minute. No worries. No worries. Welcome back, everybody. Um, I know there's people are going to come back in about a minute, uh, but if you want to put in the chat uh, how that was for you, did you meet somebody new? Welcome back. Uh, welcome back, everybody. I don't. I think we're going to be coming back in about a couple more. Here we go. Everybody's coming back. So great, great, great. So welcome back. I hope you had a good conversation with your colleagues. Um, you can put in the chat how that went for you. Uh, any reflections? Any questions you had about last week's content? Uh, you can put in the chat, or you can unmute yourself. It's really up to you. I love it. Fariba is just straight driving right now. So. <laughs> <laughs> okay. What, what it's not you... safe, Fariba. I'm gonna I'm gonna deactivate your video. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Cyrus, I know you're concerned about her safety. That's what I'm hearing from you. Well, she's muted, so. Yes, exactly. <laughs> Fariba is a CPDC member, so I can. She and I know each other pretty well. <laughs> okay, great. Fariba, so... I'm gonna deactivate your video. Okay. <laughs> So Gail said, nice to meet someone new. Great. Jocelyn was, I learned of the, of the challenges other clients are experiencing. Great. And Jennifer, always nice to meet more coworkers. Um, you know, I love doing these breakout rooms, uh, you know, like I said last week is because this, this builds community and also we're working from home and we don't really have that connection as much with our colleagues. So I think this is a, a great way to do it. Um, was there any questions about the content um, for those folks in terms of last week? Because I'm going to be going over it, but... Um, if you have any questions now, I could I could um, answer them. But if not, I can go over the content. Anybody? Okay. All right. All right. Let me share my screen again. Okay, uh, just quickly, these are my starting points. There'll be more questions and answers, uh, ongoing learning process. Uh, we are equals in this in this space, so we're working together for student success. And your all your identities they matter, and the experiences matter here. So there are in the room. So we are here to learn from each other. So that's a very co-creation space. Um, again, the fourfold way I, I like to start off with for those new uh, show up and choose to be present. Like I said, I acknowledge there's so many things going on, and I'm glad you're here. Pay attention to what has heart and meaning, um, not only just your head but your entire body. Tell your truth without blame or judgment because uh, we're all learning in this space and don't be attached to the results because um, if something's alive in this uh, space and time, we will, we will address it. Uh, so those are my fourfold ways. Okay, so I'm gonna do some content review uh, for those of you uh, who, um, are, who came last week, but also for those of you who are new. Um, and I wanna really focus on the top right one of, that's the new image I've been using in terms of, it's not a perfect image about equity versus equality, but it is the image I've been using in terms of, we, if we think about equality for our students, um, if uh, everybody's getting the same bike, right? Um, and, but then the question is, if, if we're all equal, does that mean that that person needs that same bike to get where they need to go? And so uh, when I think of it with the equity lens, we think about the students uh, 
what are their actual needs and how do we suit those needs? How do they gain access to those uh, resources uh, so they can be successful? And so at the bottom one, the person needed a three uh, wheeled bike, that person got it. The person needed a larger bike, taller individual, uh, that person will be successful. And then the person said, okay, that bike was, was fitting. And then there goes me, uh, the smaller bike, uh, cause I need a smaller bike cause I couldn't reach the pedals. And so in terms of equity equality, it's, it's, it's really, basically, it's really thinking about meeting the needs of the individual person. Um, and so what do we need to do for that? So that's an equity image I like to use uh, for a review for folks. And then uh, this concept of equity, the definition, because uh, people are thinking like, what is the definition? It's the state equality of ideal being just, impartial, and fair. It's uh, synonymous with fairness and justice, right? To be achieved and sustained, equity needs to be thought as structural and systemic concept. So when we think about equity, uh, it's a buzzword right now, but when we really think about the deep equity work, we're thinking about systemic and structural change. Um, and then I like the, the pie image here because the idea, it's not a deficit zero-sum thinking. It's actually more and more expansive growth mindset is we're actually teaching others to make their own pie. And so we have more pies, not just one pie in terms of the equity definitions. Curtis Linton, um, and I want to point out here that educators provide all students, and I, again, I want to say all students with the individual support they need to reach and exceed a common standard. Yes, there are disproportionately impacted students, Historically and marginally, they, have, uh, they haven't um, achieved and succeeded at the same rate as uh, at a par level. Uh, so we focus on the disproportionate impact of students, although that doesn't mean we don't help all students. So I just want to let you know that. Um, and so uh, with that, um, I do want to ask if there are any questions right now about that, because I, I talked about it last week and briefly went over this week. Are there any questions in terms of equity, in terms of any of the content I went over. Can you put it in the chat or if you can unmute yourself, it's okay. Anybody? I can wait seven seconds. I also was a adjunct faculty, so. Nope. Oh, okay, we got one, here we go. Building trust. Jocelyn, can you uh, explain a little bit more about what you, you, you said so that we can have a little bit brief conversation about it? Yeah, you know, um, Fabio and I um, were in our breakout room together and he um, brought up something I thought was really important to understand is how um, dicey, you know, equity and actually um, achieving equity is because you have to look at the individual student and what those needs are. Yep. Um, obviously, I work in a department where we primarily serve um, black students. And so in dealing with each black student, even each student within a racial context is all different. Mm -hmm. And so being able to individualize that kind of, of service is very difficult because so many students have so many different issues. But we as you know, staff members and faculty members and you know, everyone who works at the college, we have to build trust with the students because the students have to tell us what their individual needs are. And some of those individual needs are so um, uncomfortable for a student to talk about. Mm -hmm. um, and so being able to give them the services they need without um, outing students in certain circumstances. You know, I have students who are trans students who are dealing with, you know, naming issues. And um, they also don't want other people to recognize who they are. So being able to build the rapport with the student for them to be feel safe enough mm -hmm. um, in an environment like this to be able to talk about you know um, the intersection they're having as a, a trans person and an African American person and also feeling you know racially discriminated against all at one time it's a very complicated um, circumstance to manage. Jocelyn, you 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 said so much there. It was a lot of uh, great information, and, and I think we should unpack uh, that. I, I don't know if people want to chime in as well, but I'll give my um, you know I'll give my added to it. But uh, I I think trust is one of the biggest things that we need to think about uh, because you know when we think about students' experience and even my experience as a community college student is I come from a neighborhood that was really rough in terms of like a low economic background. There was a lot of gangs, 
And so I didn't have a lot of trust within people because that was my survival mode. So we have to think about where the students are coming from. They probably, they might have a lot of um, uh, institutional woundedness. Maybe their experience wasn't that great um, at, in their schools. Um, so there's so many different things they come with uh, that, that happen when they come to the school. And so you bring up such a great point is how do we, um, how do we connect with our students, right? Um, and, and, it's, and it's not as easy as people think, just tell me what you need and then I will do it for you. It doesn't work like that for some students. And I really wanna thank you for pointing out that all students are very different, which they all are. And even in racialized groups, they're very different because there's an intersectionality piece when we're talking about, you know, like you were saying, African-American and there was a trans student. And there's so many different aspects of people's lives, maybe their first generation, maybe there's uh, their single parent household, even maybe they, ha they have children. So there's so many different factors. But I think what the essence of what you're saying is how do we connect and how do we build that rapport with them so then they can build a trust so we're able to help and support them. So for example, I work with this one student. And, and this is a real life example. He, he, he calls me Kuya Tony because Kuya means big brother in Filipino, right? Um, and he said to me, Tony, um, I need to talk to you. And I said, okay, what's up? And he's like, uh, you know, uh, something's going on in my house. And so I had to continue to pry, right? So, so what's going on at your house? Um, well, um, you know, COVID thing happened. I'm like, okay, what does that mean? And he said, well, my parents lost their job. I said, okay, so what does that mean? And so and I just kept listening to him and keep asking the questions. So he knew I was very, very, very much interested in what he was saying. And he says, um, I can't go to school anymore. I said, why can't you go to school? Because I don't have money. And so his question actually in the beginning was, I need financial aid and resources so I can go to school. But he didn't say that. It took me 30 minutes before I got to that question. And so the thing is, is when we think about students is how do we continue to um, build our emotional intelligence muscle to understand really what that student is asking. Um, and I think that's important as we do this work because maybe some people are like, I asked that student what they want, they didn't tell me, and so you know what, that's their fault. But if we think about the historical and marginalization and the racism and the things that students have been affected by, not all students, but the ones that have came to us that have these wounds and that have this trauma, we have to think about and be more empathetic and compassionate for their experience because it's not just about, okay, here you go, Filipino students, here's some financial aid, here's a counselor, be successful. Dr. Joy DeGroote doesn't say that. She says we need to put a village around that person, really understand what this person is going through, so therefore we can ask and help that student. Um, so Justin, I appreciate you saying that. There was so much richness in what you said. Um, I'm seeing Fabio, right? Uh, Fabio uh, had a question, raised hand. Do you mind if you un unmute yourself and ask that? Yeah, no, I just wanted to um, follow up with what Jocelyn said. Thank you, Jocelyn, for sharing that. But I think, um, well, I, I was getting it in our discussion in the breakout room was, you know, a lot of these students, you know, come from backgrounds uh, maybe different than ours and their experience, you know, there may be a couple of months removed from high school. So maybe the focus was to just get them to graduate and now they're in this different environment. So maybe they don't feel comfortable opening up to us like, well, who is this person? I don't know you. Um, why should I share my story with you? Right? So I think that it touches on what Jocelyn said is <clears throat> building that trust, right? Getting them to open up so that we can better help them. Yes, thank you. Uh, thank you, Fabio, for that. Um, uh, and then what, you know, we have a lot of uh, amazing classified professionals in the room. So why don't you put in the chat or if you want to unmute yourself is how do you build trust? With your student, what are what is that one thing or two things you do with your students as a classified professional to build trust with those students? Many of you are like, you know, I don't see students, or maybe I just see them really quickly. But there are some ways that you can build trust with them. Um, so why don't we just like uh, gauge and and you know um, read the room about the brilliance that's happening in here? So you can just put in the chat, what do you do um, to build that trust? Um, it's very important. Uh, so please put that in there and I'll read it out. Or you can also read the chat. Sharing my truth with students, yes. So sharing and being vulnerable about yourself is important because it shows vulnerability and then they feel like they can open up. Yes, great. Other folks.
Joshua said, I, I dedicate time to them. This allows them to know you're invested in them and truly interested in helping them. Perfect. I think that's so important of time um, and showing that you care. I think it, it shows a big, uh, big, big, big heart, your heart to them um, and, and sitting down with them, having lunch with them, you know, asking them how their day is. Monica said, I think it's a start. To, uh, I think it starts first with being present, showing up consistently. Yes. Because like I was saying before is uh, maybe they didn't have a great experience with, uh, with adults um, in terms of people older than them that they, don't, they, they have some lack of trust. So how do we show up for them? That consistency, great. Being a good listener, yes. Being a good listener and being a compassionate listener. Um, and maybe sometimes students don't need answers. They don't need advice. All they need is someone to talk to, someone to soundboard with. Um, great. Uh, what else we got? Sharing about myself. Um, Great. And then we have uh, learning to adapt to ways of communication. So, so navigating, I don't know if you heard this concept of, 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 of um, what is that concept I'm saying is um, code switching, right? How do you code switch? Um, speaking the way they speak, speaking their language, speaking to, to what, what speaks to them, following up, consistency, be friendly and oh, smile. That is one interesting thing that you can do for a student is when you see them is you can smile. Maybe they may not smile back at you, but they know that there's a friendly face behind that smile, which is very important, especially folks who are like, I don't know where um, psych services is. And you smile at them and say, I can help you. That's very, very important. So ask questions, make a connection. Um, doing Zoom session with new students in the online environment. Perfect. Great, great. All this is great discussion. And I think we, as we uh, build trust, and that's why uh, when we do these Zoom sessions, my workshops, is I always do community building because the essence of, of equity is very much about building community. It's very much about how do we create villages so we can support our students and we can support each other. Um, and you have that because when we actually look at, um, you know, even ourselves, even myself, is like, what is that support around me? To, so then it helps me become successful. So very good. Thank you. This was a very rich, rich discussion. Um, any other questions before I move on? No. Okay, great. I want to show you a quick video by Dr. Pedro Noguera. It's a six minute video. I don't know if you know who he is, but he's actually the new dean, um, a dean at University of Southern California, where we're going to be talking about the Q Institute, uh, the um, Center for Urban Education. Let me make sure I can make this happen. Let me make sure. Okay, we got to try this here. Can you all see this uh, YouTube video? Yes? Okay, here we go. Here we go. And let me know if you can hear the sound as well. He's not talking yet, so. Well, in the context of education, the term equity has come to mean the need to focus more directly, not simply on equal opportunity, that is making sure that kids have access to schools and the opportunity theoretically to learn, but really focusing on outcomes and results. And the analogy I often make is uh, most parents practice equity with their kids. That is, we don't treat all kids the same because they have different needs. And when in schools that, that are really focused on equity, they're trying to meet the different needs of kids and do so in ways with a focus on outcomes. Uh, schools are set up to be the, the equalizer of opportunity. That was the mandate early on, was that we would use education to promote merit, to promote talent. And so theoretically, you'd want to make sure that all kids, regardless of background, got similar educational opportunities. But that's not what we do. Obviously, if you go to school in the South Bronx, you get a very different education than if you go to schools in Scarsdale. But what's more, even within schools, we exacerbate inequity because in many schools, there's a deliberate practice of assigning the best teachers to teach the highest achieving kids and the least effective and least experienced teachers to teach the high need kids. This never works, but schools consistently do it largely because it serves their political purposes of both appeasing the parents of the high achieving kids and appeasing teachers with seniority. Parents play a critical role in influencing what schools do. Uh, and sometimes they can exacerbate the inequities. And that's because the affluent parents who are highly educated and have lots of time on their hands can put pressure on the schools to get what they want. You can never blame a parent for trying to get the best for their kids. 
However, sometimes what that means is that some kids are getting more because their parents are able to put the pressure on, lobby the schools to get resources directed at their kids, whereas other parents either don't have the time, don't have the know-how, or aren't treated in the same way when they engage schools, and therefore their kids don't get served as well. Well, the only way to really create equitable schools is to really focus on that as your goal um, and making sure that, first of all, that you have good leaders who have a vision that combines a commitment to academic excellence to a commitment to equity. And that's important because in this country, we tend to see the two as being conflicting goals. We tend to think that the more we do for excellence, the less we'll be able to do for equity because in our mind, ex there's only a small number of elite kids who are excellent and we're going to give more to them and that's what, for example, we're doing gifted programs. We give them the best, and then we forget about the rest of the kids. So we build in inequity. When we combine excellence and, and equity, what we're, what we're focused on is how do we make sure that all kids are exposed to high standards, quality teachers? How do we make sure that even the kids who come in who are further behind, who need more help, get that help? What we really should be aiming for are kids who are learning uh, ideas, knowledge, and skills that they can apply to their own situation. So they, they can understand the utility of what they learn and how it's relevant to their life circumstances. So I'll give you one example. I, a teacher I was working with in Oakland, California, uh, she had to teach environmental history, or environmental science rather, and she was interested in making connections between the students' lives that she was teaching and, and the subject. And so what she did, she asked me how she should approach it. I said, well, why don't you spend some time exploring this neighborhood? And you might get some ideas about the most critical environmental issues in this neighborhood. And the neighborhood was West Oakland. It's a neighborhood that has a lot of heavy industry, a lot of traffic. Um, it's an area with a lot of toxic sites. And as she drove the community, she saw that. She also saw that there were a lot of families in that, in that community that had gardens in the backyard. And uh, she imagined that many of those families were eating fruits and vegetables from those gardens and not aware of the fact that the soil was probably contaminated with lead, lead that was coming into the soil from the atmosphere. So what she did was she designed a whole unit uh, with her students, for her students, on the effects of lead in the environment. And it started by showing how lead goes from the industry or from the cars into the atmosphere, how it goes from the atmosphere into the soil through the rain, uh, what happens when you, how it goes from the soil into the plants, and then what happens when you ingest those plants, particularly in small children whose brains are first developing, and lead contamination really can have a very damaging effect on the development of children's brains. She then taught her kids how to do soil testing, and they went out into the community to test the soil for lead content, and they mapped uh, where the lead contamination was greatest, and they produced these very intricate charts showing what was causing this contamination, that is, its proximity to a freeway or to a foundry or some other kind of heavy industry. Uh, after they produced the report, the kids were very concerned because of what they'd learned. And they said to the teacher that they felt they had to do more than merely produce the report, that they needed to do something with the information now. And she agreed, and they contacted the county health commissioner and approached the county health commissioner about um, uh, doing something about this problem. And after reading their report, hearing them speak very... Uh, intelligently and passionately about this problem, what the County Health Commission agreed to do was first of all send out a letter to all the residents in this neighborhood in West Oakland warning them of the effects of toxics um, lead to, uh, and lead contamination in the soil, but also offering free topsoil for any family that wanted gardens but didn't uh, have the ability to get uh, clean topsoil. And uh, I often point that as an example because my bet is that those kids will know about the effects of lead in the environment forever. And that's because they were able to see how what they were learning could be used in a way that could really improve their lives and their community. Okay, great. Thank you very much. That's Pedro Noguera. Please look him up. Um, he's a heavy hitter in, in the equity movement. He's been saying these things for years, for decades. Um, but I wanted to share that with you because he touched upon so many different things. He touched upon um, how do you connect with students, right? Um, how do we, we actually understand their living situations, not from a gaze, but actually from a compassionate and empathetic um, lens that you're not just saying, oh, poor them, they live in this situation. That's not what we're saying. It's really trying to understand where they're coming from. Then he's talking about culturally relevancy. How do, we, how do we bring that into the classrooms and as classified professionals, how do you bring that within the context of your work? And then is 
how do they actually do something about that? So that's called participatory action research. And so really engaging and empowering students to be agents of change. And so this is just, I, he, he said a lot in that six minute video, but I just wanna share with you, he, he touched upon the cultural relevancy, he touched upon um, accessing resources and, and connecting it to their actual lives. Um, and so that's something uh, that, that you can learn more about from him. Just look him up, Google him, you'll, you'll find a bunch of stuff um, with him. Great. So, um, so with that, um, I just want to share with you just, just a review, because that kind of set us up about the equity piece, is like, how does this work at Santa Monica College, right? And I just want to reiterate, these are the things I said last week, was this is their equity vision. This is your equity vision statement. Dynamic and a culture responsive, which Pedro, Dr. Pedro Noguera was talking about, culture responsive educational community that upholds these values, equity, inclusion, and social justice as a pathway to personal academic excellence, right? Personal excellence, right? Talking about how do you help in your, in, in your communities. And then this is the equity mission statement, educational uh, institution providing an equitable learning and working environment. We intend to make clear that our lives, values, and practices are committed to inclusive excellence, which Dr. Pedro Naguera was talking about, which is reflected in our student outcomes and employee satisfaction. So just wanted to just remind you about that. And then last week, we talked about the Santa Monica College Equity Framework. Equity is at the center, and you have four different components of authentic communication, right? Um, cultural humility, lifelong learning, continuing to learn, uh, learning about other people, high impact practices. What are those practices that, uh, that can help our students be successful? Cultural responsive facilitation and change management in terms of um, cultural responsive uh, teaching, pedagogy, as well as facilitation and management. How do we change and transform the institution in terms of equity, being an equitable leader, right? And so again, these are uh, some of the guiding questions um, that are in your equity plan. Um, and so I wanna make sure that I point those out, that, that this, these are the four components with the questions that come to it. So if you wanna learn more about that. And then we did a activity, which I wanna show you for those folks um, that, uh, no, not that one, uh, let's see, this one. Can you see this uh, Google Doc? Yes, okay, great. And this is the activity we did last week and such amazing information. I um, mean, a great document to show what the classified professionals are doing. We have authentic communication, and these are all the different people or the departments that they're doing outreach, admissions and records, Black Collegians, the Welcome Center, the library, um, and so on. So I just want to acknowledge the great work that the classified professionals are doing and will do. Um, also right here, we have the high impact practices. Um, communities are making a diverse population such as LB LGBTQ plus community, Student equity communities, a and is doing this. Um, food closets, HR is doing this. Change management. Um, and these are the things. And just wanted to point this out because it's important because classified professionals are doing the work and they are leaning into the agents of change for the equity uh, movement that's happening at your college. And these are some things that you wanted to work um, on uh, in, in the future. Right? Someone said more equity-focused discussions among staff including some with student input. So student st staff faculty town halls, uh, and then change man develop a program for free access to textbook for students. Um, so this is just a document that we did, um, that we did together as an activity. And we're gonna build upon this document um, later on. But, um, and so I'll go back to the presentation here. And so um, we're, we are gonna take a, a quick break before we get into some more nitty gritty. Uh, we have Hannah who's gonna talk about these uh, the IR, the IR study that she did, and I'm going to talk about the Center for Urban Education's equity mindedness of how people are seeing how to be, how to be and develop your equity mind. Um, so let's see, somebody put in the chat. Um, okay, so, so I just want to let you know, please come back in about five minutes, take a bio break, drink some water, and then I will um, we'll come back. All right, so, and if you wanna turn off your videos and your audio, it's great as well. But I, it's, I see 10.55 now, we'll come back at 11. That's okay. <clears throat> Cyrus, did you have any quick announcements before? Or we're we good? I think we're good. <laughs> okay. 
Uh, hi, Hannah. I know you're in the room. I just want to acknowledge you. Hi. Okay, great. Thank you so much. I'll see you guys in a, after yeah, your break. Yeah, thank you. Tony, if you want to take a break, I can monitor the room. So, okay, let me let me take a drink of water, but I'll yeah, go for it. So, thank you. Mm -hmm. Hi, sorry, Cyrus. How are you doing this morning? This is Josh Casillas. Hi, Josh. Hi, sorry, I sent you that email. I have no idea what day it was. <laughs> I sent you an email. Bro. I was like, oh, how embarrassing. I apologize once again. <laughs> okay. I, we had another meeting scheduled, and that date was wrong, and I looked at this date, and it, I just got completely confused. I, I apologize. It was embarrassing. It's all, it's all okay. Yeah, it, 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 it's COVID. <laughs> it's the pandemic. Right, 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 right. Well, hey, well, Cyrus. Thank mm -hmm. you for understanding. Have a, I'll talk soon. Cyrus, yes. can you hear me? Oh. Yes. Hey, Freeba. Hey, I'm going to disconnect for about 10 minutes. And I'm going to get home, and then I'll connect on the computer. You got it. No worries, Freeba. Okay, Freeba. bye, sweetie. <laughs> Be safe, Okay, Freeba. bye. <laughs> All right. So um, just to build upon, uh, and thank you for coming back. I hope you had a you know, quick uh, you know, bio break or take a drink of water, or get some sun. Uh, but I just wanted to share with you, because uh, Dr. Pedro Naguera, I believe he works with them too as well. He's some type of partner. But from Dr. Estela Ben Simon's work, uh, she created the Center for Urban Education and she created this framework along with other colleagues. It's called the Equity Mindedness. And um, there is a file that Cyrus, I believe, uh, emailed you uh, called the Equity Indicators. And uh, it's just a reference. It's, 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 a, it's a tool that you can use to look at in terms of how are you being equity minded, right? Because there's an actual concept and, and she created this from the Center for Urban Education. Mm -hmm. And Tony, I'm going to put, um, actually, actually uh, listed the file, both the files today and today's uh, uh, session on the website. So I'm actually going to send the website link right now. But if you look for today's uh, session, um, you'll find the two files underneath the registration link. Okay. Thank you, Cyrus. Mm -hmm. um, and I'm not sure if Santa, Santa Monica College brought some, um, some of their colleagues to the Q Institute uh, before. They possibly have, but they have an institute. I'm not promoting it, but I'm just saying there is an institute that they people can go there and actually learn more about this. I'm just doing a very, very quick brief overview just to share with you uh, today what it, what it actually means. So the term equity mindedness refers to the perspective and mode of thinking uh, for practitioners who call attention to patterns of inequity in student outcomes, right? These practitioners are willing to take a personal and institutional responsibility. And I want to put um, emphasis on personal and institutional because oftentimes maybe people may think it's the institutional problem, but actually we are also involved in that process as a lifelong learner. And how do we continue to develop our equity muscle and our equity mindedness to really, really think critically how to best serve our students. Um, and so they're critically reassessing their own practices, like I said, and it requires that practitioners are race conscious. I think in the Q Institute, they very, very much are talking about race. And in this moment of time in our society and, and what's happening, the shifts in our society are very much talking about anti-racism, racial justice work, and so on. So she already put attention to this a long time ago in terms of how that deals with equity. So, and so these are the, the, that's the brain on the left, as you see. And these are the things um, that I see on the right that I'm calling the gears. And in order for all of this to work, the gears got to work together. Right. And so there's no particular order to these gears, but I will just talk about each briefly about each one of them. So one, it's evidence based. And so what does that mean is that means that there's actually data that is collected to really understand the stories of what's happening. But again, evidence based doesn't mean that it's that is the end all be all. This is just to data inform 
a view of the context of what the students and our colleagues are experiencing. It's very important that we think about that because we have to analyze the data from an equity lens and we have to really disaggregate data because like um, a prior colleague was saying, uh, I believe it was Jocelyn, was that even in racialized um, communities, everybody's different as well. So we also have to think about that, okay? And then again, uh, race consciousness, to really see that we do see race and people do have a racialized experience. And so we need to really think that that experience is in the room and we need to honor those experiences because it matters to them. It may not matter to you, but it definitely will matter to some of our students who come with that experience, who have intergenerational trauma, who are experiencing um, you know, racism on a daily basis, who are experiencing in their, in, their, in, their, in their communities, in their institutions, at their job, and so on. So we need to really understand it from that lens. Um, institutionally focused means what Dr. Pedro Naguera said was we need to focus on being equity-minded as an institution. What is the commitment of the institution to really, really decrease that equity achievement gap and the racial achievement gap, okay? And then systematically aware. So when I talk, talked about the deep equity work, we're talking about what are the systems in place that cause the barriers for students to be successful? We have to be aware and analyze these systems to make sure that we know where those inequities are so we can actually either reform them, dismantle them, transform them, or whatever. So we have to be aware of all of our systems. And then the last one is equity advancing, is how do we advance equity in our, our, um, on our campus? How is that connected to institutionally focused and the commitment to equity in terms of what we're trying to do, as Dr. Pedro Nogueira said. So these are all gears that work together, and I just wanted to introduce you the concept today. And this final slide before I turn it over to Hannah in our next part is just a, a quote from the Equity, the uh, Q Institute. In order to understand to become equity minded, it warrants that various practitioners, all of us, uh, assess and acknowledge that your practices may not be working. So we have to think about our own practices, not only um, in, our, in our daily lives, but our, our departmental practices, our um, our division practices and our system-wide practices. It takes understanding of inequities as a dysfunction of various structures and policy and practices that they can control. These practitioners question their own personal assumptions, recognize their own stereotypes that harm student success and continually reassess their practice to create change. So that's a very cultural humility framework. It's like, how can I personally recognize my own biases, my own stereotypes, because we all have them. Biases are, are happening all the time in our brains is because of our experiences. Um, there's, there's research that talks about that. And so part of taking on this framework is that institution and practitioners become accountable. And that's big, is accountability for the success of their students and see these racial gaps as a personal and institutional responsibility. So it's accountability. How do you have a personal accountability and you are taking that step as classified professionals to be accountable for your learning as you're learning about equity and equity mindedness. You're taking that on for yourself to say, how can I do better? Not only for myself, so I can help other folks, especially my students. Um, and so that's equity mindedness in a nutshell. So we're gonna expand on that um, with the data informed data evidence. And so um, I'm gonna introduce uh, Dr. Hannah Lawler and um, in her office, she created an amazing document uh, about the story of students in COVID-19. And she has this document that, that, that's always gonna be, um, that's gonna be in the chat. And it's talked about faculty. But what I did was I switched it to classified professionals also can support them because we also are leading into this. And so um, I invited Hannah and she's been so gracious with her time to tell us about how that study was conducted, what is the study about, and give us some background context. So thank you, Hannah, for being here. I appreciate you. Sure. Hello, everyone. Um, I'm so excited that you guys are getting to participate in this opportunity. Um, I know, you know, I obviously am not a classified educator, so I haven't been um, involved in this, but I know uh, Tony um, offers a lot of really good information and is a good facilitator. So you're in good hands. Um, so, yeah, so I think, you know, um, 
I wanted to kind of give you a background of this uh, project we conducted in collaboration with several others on campus, including um, the Senate Institutional Effectiveness Committee, the Academic Senate, um, as well as um, PDC, which actually included CPDC as well. Um, and the way the, story, uh, the purpose of the project came about was, uh, you know, as we were moving to remote instruction in March, um, like our office was responsible for kind of gauging and assessing what students needed. Um, and, you know, we also did kind of an employee survey. Um, and we, it was mostly just kind of like an intake of like who needs what, who needs what, like computers and that kind of thing. Um, but what that data didn't tell us was what, what are the student stories? Like what are they going through day in, day out and trying to manage their distance learning while dealing with the pandemic as well as whatever responsibilities that they have at home. And so um, the, the students actually from associated students, the student leaders, um, they came to Mike Chiwetasi and I and said, you know, I, we just don't feel like the campus is understanding kind of what we're going through. Um, and what we understood, you know, as, uh, you know, as the Office of Institutional Research is that stories are really powerful in getting people to really understand, um, you know, and the stories of these 10 students, they're not representative of every single student, but I do feel like there's a lot of common themes um, that students experience. And so um, we didn't want this to be just, uh, we're going to you know, talk to students and create kind of a profile about what their experience has been. Uh, but we also wanted to tie it directly to, uh, at the time, because we were working with PDC, like how do we connect these stories and the challenges and barriers students are going through with um, concrete strategies that faculty can implement. So uh, we conducted the interviews during spring break. So it was really quickly right after COVID, maybe like two or three weeks after. And um, I had an open mind. I said, I talked to as many students as I would. Um, but I think around 10, it was kind of serendipitous around 10 students. I kind of kept hearing the same things over and over. And so we decided to stop with 10 students because uh, we got a really like a breadth of experience. Um, and so what you see here uh, is a list, list of the 10 students I spoke with. These are pseudonyms. Many of the students chose their own pseudonyms um, and kind of the title of their story. Um, so what, you will, what we prepared was um, one page for each student. And we didn't do a whole essay about the student, but kind of just a very brief narrative of what they were going through. Um, and a, a quote we pulled directly from um, my interviews with them. And then we also um, included two or three strategies that um, you know, faculty could use to address um, you know, those specific barriers and challenges students were facing. Those strategies I did not invent. Um, while I am the author of the report, <laughs> I, I, you know, I, I'm not in the classroom, so I don't know. Uh, but what I did was I like watched dozens of webinars, read dozens of articles um, that were curated on the Center for Teaching Excellence's website, um, and basically tried to match based on what I knew and the evidence of what worked with what the students' challenges were. So. Um, I want to, can I share screen two? Um, yeah, of course. Okay. Yeah, let me stop sharing. Go ahead. Oh, it says disabled participant. Okay, let me uh, do that. Yeah, I think Tony, I think you might okay. need to. Go ahead, you're good now. Okay. So let's see. Um, oh, sorry, don't look at that student data. <laughs> um, so yeah, so here, um, I'm not expecting you to be able to read everything, but I just want to show you kind of what each of the student profiles look like. And so we have the student, the title of their story, um, like the meat of their story, their quote, and then like strategies down here on how faculty can support. Um, and so when, while we, um, you know, I, I, I work, work in academic affairs, like the division, and so it's like natural for me to, I think, reach out to the academic side. Uh, but we, uh, early on, I connected with Cyrus and I said, how can we use these stories um, to, you know, 
for the classified educators and getting them to dialogue and think about and reflect upon what they can do to address the student needs. And um, a lot of the, like the strategies that came out, there were equity-minded strategies. So they weren't just student-centered strategies, but these were specific things that we knew that racially minoritized students were having difficulty and would be more effective with them. Um, so, you know, kind of what can we, how can we fold this out? And so when we heard that um, Cyrus and, you know, the Professional Development Committee was sponsoring and bringing this opportunity for this series, uh, we thought that we would include these stories as kind of um, the why for get, you know, the why we, we are wanting um, all, of our, all of us on campus to be equity minded. So, um, so yeah, so I think, you know, um, you know, while these are, you know, you can read these faculty strategies, I think, but we really want you to think about what you can do in your role to, to, to kind of address students and respond to students. Um, and these aren't just challenges that are COVID related. You'll see a lot in the story, it's human related. Um, and it's very real about like real what students are going through. So, yeah. I think that was my five minutes, but do anybody have any questions about the stories? It is available on the IR website. Um, I'll put that in here for you. Yeah, if, if, if anybody has questions or comments, um, you can put it in the chat or you can unmute yourself um, just to understand uh, more about, uh, you know, how IR conducted the study or other things that she wanted to mention. So today they're, they're a quiet bunch today, Cyrus. So. <laughs> yeah, I only see Jocelyn. Hey, Jocelyn. <laughs> so, does anybody have any questions for Hannah? Oh. They're a quick read, so I really encourage you to, you know, it's like 10 pages, so when you get a chance. And if you are interested, um, we also did a flex day presentation on this for the faculty, and we recorded it. Okay, great. So, Hannah, um, thank you for your time. And we're actually going to build off your presentation uh, now. And so, oh, um, yeah, so you want to stick around. Uh oh, he froze. Let me share my screen once again. Can you see that? Yep. I just want to make sure. Okay. All right. All right. So, Oh, wait, I'm going backwards. What's going on? Okay. So, uh, again, just, uh, you know, referencing, um, both Hannah and I referenced the Q Institute. Um, these are the things I just went briefly over in terms of how they're thinking. And so how am I going to couple this with our activity next? So evidence-based. This is what we're going to do right now. We got some evidence. We got some qualitative um, information. And we got real live stories. And, of course, they're pseudonym, pseudonyms. Um, so they're actually actual people, actual students, but they're not the actual names just for privacy and, and so on to honor their stories. And so again, like this is your framework and we're gonna build off that the authentic communication, cultural humility, cultural responsive facilitation, high impact practices. So what are we gonna do? What we're actually gonna do, here's the, here is the uh, instructions. Let me put it in the chat and bear with me because there's a lot of information um, about this. Uh, let's see, okay, I'm gonna put this in the chat as the instructions. And then also here's the Google Doc in the chat as well. I just wanted you to reference that as well, but I'll go over that. Um, all right, let me go back to sharing. Sorry. Okay, so what are we gonna do? We are going to reference the equity minus framework along with your Santa Monica College Equity Framework. And then we're gonna use these stories, right? And each breakout room will be assigned a specific student and a student story, and everyone will discuss and empathize with that student experience. And what I wanna, why I say discuss and empathize, because I don't wanna see it from like an outsider's point of view, oh, so sorry about these students' experiences. We wanna empathize with that student experience so we can better meet their needs, right? And so what we're going to do is we're using the Santa Monica College Equity Framework. How will your group, your classified professional group, support recommendations for the student of each component of the framework? 
Okay, what does that mean? Um, and so let me go to my other screen, the, the one that I was um, referencing. Okay, so this is that Google Doc I showed you. And let me navigate it for you for those of you who are like, what's this document? So each group is gonna be assigned um, a student story. And so the way you can click on that student story is you can go to, say, you, say I signed you Amy. You can click Amy and it'll go straight to Amy. Okay, if I said, I, if I signed you Marcus, we click Marcus and there you go. And each one of them actually has the equity mindedness as well as the equity framework. Okay, and it has the instructions um, here. And so what you're gonna do is um, you're going to first look at the stories. So can you see the stories here? Yes, yes, okay. So you're gonna go and we'll say we'll start with Catalina. Okay, Catalina, so as a group, you're going to read and discuss and empathize with Catalina's story and so on. You read this together and then you say, okay, we got it. We understand what this person is going through. Um, there are some strategies that they're talking about, but as classified professionals, what could we do? And so I refer back to Catalina and I says, in terms of authentic communication, what can we do as classified professionals or our department to help better her situation, to help, help her um, gain more resources, help her feel more connected to the institution. What can we do, right? So you write that down. For example, um, more transparency, um, you know, more transparency for email communication. I don't know, right? So you write that for Catalina. Then you go to cultural humility, lifelong learning. How do we learn more about her? Um, okay, so maybe, uh, Maybe we want to see more um, cultural identifications on the wall that represent her, right? So you can put that. High impact practice, anti racist practices, what can we do? So each one of those components, I want you to write a support recommendation that a classified professional or a classified professional area could do to support this student. And so the, the, that's the goal, the goal, and that's the instruction. And as you um, fill this out with your team and your group, We'll come back and we'll share out what we, we found. You'll have about 15 uh, minutes to do so. Is that, that was clear? Questions? No, okay. And so make sure you have your um, Google Doc open and then um, also the shared stories document. Cyrus, um, I think it's on uh, the chat. Can we put it on the chat? the i'm actually trying to look for it right now but yes I'll, I'll put it in the chat okay okay so the files in the chat okay so let me um stop sharing my screen and then what i'll do is i will break you up into rooms and i will tell you who are you going to uh be with in terms of your your who your team uh will discuss that group that person so let me recreate that let's see how many, we have 26, so let's say about four each, four times six, okay. I don't know, so 26, 10, so two, three, so two to three, okay. Okay, 10 years, all right. Um, okay, so please, uh, Please, um, I'm going to write in the chat who, or I'm going to also say it, breakout room one, you are going to be Catalina. So I'll write it in the group. Breakout room one is Catalina, and your that group is Anne, Carla, and Cyrus, okay? And then breakout room two is uh, Diana, Phoebe, I hope I said that right, and Janet, okay? So, and that is Sarah, that, the student story. Okay. Breakout room three, so just please pay attention to your rooms, is Gina, Jennifer, and Katya, and that is Elena. And then breakout room four is Andres and Christine, um, and that is Tony. Okay. And breakout room five 
through five is Jocelyn, Luis, and Olga. Okay, and that is uh, Amy. And breakout room six is Janet and Linda, and that is Jacelyn. And then breakout room seven, seven is Christina. Um, well, there's no, uh, Christina has by herself, but I'll put her, I'll, I'll put somebody else in there for you, Christina. But breakout room seven is Christina. Uh, that's who you, uh, that's the person in that room, but you're gonna be analyzing Diego. And there's nobody in breakout room eight, but breakout room nine is uh, uh, Aaron or, and Amelia, and that is uh, Marcus, the student. We're gonna analyze, and then breakout room 10 is Estella and Paige, and you are gonna be um, talking about Fiona, all right? So uh, does everybody have the file now? I just wanna make sure everybody has a file of the student story. No? No, okay, let me make sure I get that file as well. I don't know, let me see. Okay, I put it in the chat. It's, it's uploading now. Um, okay, it's in the chat. You can download it and then enjoy. Again, if you need help, just press that question mark button. But your idea is first is to really talk about the student story and then using the framework, how are you going to support them in terms of your support recommendations? All right, enjoy. See you in about 15 minutes, 10 to 15 minutes. Hi, Fariba. Hi, Tony. Give me a second. I just got home. No problem. Take your time. Take your time. Okay. You don't have to put me in a room right now, right? Uh, I don't know. I think I, I already put you in a room, but I can. If you want, can I put you in a room now? No, uh, I need to. No, I'm good. Okay. So you're going to wait a little bit. Stories first, yeah. Okay. This computer sucks. Okay figure this out. There, thank you. Free, but let me know when you're uh, ready to join a group. I will uh, put you in there.
Hello, Jennifer and Fariba. Hello. I was typing and accidentally hit enter and now I'm back. <laughs> you know, no worries, because one time I actually was controlling the breakout rooms and I accidentally clicked close breakout rooms and people were like, what happened? I was like, oh, I clicked the wrong button. Yeah. <laughs> hope my partner doesn't think that I like abandoned her. <laughs> <laughs> I hope not either. <laughs> oh, Gina. Yeah, Gina. Talking about Gina. Yeah. Well, they'll, they'll be back in 60 seconds. You can send her a private message and say, oh. absolutely. Yeah, no worries. That's a good idea. Okay, I'll do that. Yeah. I want to make sure I enabled that. Yeah. Yeah, they can check. Jennifer, did you, um, how was that exercise for you, that activity? It was good. We actually um, ended up filling up every box, which was, I told her, I feel like we accomplished something. Because <laughs> 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 when we started, we were like, hmm, uh, right. where, to, what, where to start? And so so yeah. you, get an a, you get an A now. Okay, I'm going to give you an A plus for filling awesome. up more boxes. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Yeah, this was, a, you know, just it's just for folks to think about how to operationalize the, equ the equity framework um, as you do your work. So, yeah, welcome back, everybody. Welcome back. Um, hi, Christine and Andres. Welcome back, everybody. Is everybody back? I hope so. Is, it, is everybody back? I think so. OK, great. So. Um, I hope you enjoyed that activity. Um, I know it's 1142, we have about 20 minutes. So I don't want, I, I really don't want to force everybody to go uh, because I want to make sure we have interest of time. And I also want to close out a couple of things before we leave. So, you know, uh, instead of me saying, okay, breakout room one goes, uh, why don't we just go with the people that want to go and then we'll see where the uh, interest of time is. So does anybody, would any, would any group would like to go? Or do I need to pick on you? <laughs> Yes. Okay. Uh, who's Christine? Your group. I will put up your the. Um, we were with Tony. Okay. Okay. Let me let me go to Tony's. Is this the one here? Yes. Okay. So Christine, you have about like you know minute or minute or two just to really talk about that. So please go ahead. I'll, so um, so Tony was uh, he's part he's the director of AS. He used to work um, part time on campus. He's inundated with emails from like everywhere. Um, he because he lost his job on campus, he couldn't afford his textbooks. And that was basically his problems. So we were able to give some authentic communication strategies and some change management, but we kind of struggled on cultural humility and anti racist practices because we would likely we've got a lot of referrals to other departments where they would probably we thought they would probably engage more on on those levels. But our big thing is we wanted to explore an efficient technology for communications, especially if he's an AS director, perhaps they could look into things like chat like hot HubSpot or Slack to reduce the email clutter. And then for his textbook problem, we want to keep getting the word out on zero cost textbooks to faculty. I work in distance ed and we're seeing more and more of that. And then um, also refer them to, to um, the BOG grant and other student grant options that might be available, especially if he's in a class that like is in a core class that uses the zero cost textbooks. And again, I'm in DE encourage, encourage, encourage faculty to use Canvas as their messaging tool and not email. And then we also wanted, we would refer him to career services, especially if he still wanted to work because it didn't say if he was like work study or he just was working on campus or what the deal was. So that's kind of where we were at. Thank you very much, Christina and your team. Um, and I love how you are telling students you can get free 
uh, resources to, to textbooks. I think all uh, faculty and students should be talking about that and, and classified professionals because, you know, that is a huge barrier because some of these math textbooks and science textbooks are like $200 um, and they can't afford them. And that's, a, that's like a car payment or their rent, part of their rent to get a textbook. So that's a great way. Um, and, you know, having, having the faculty share that and put it in their syllabus and telling them to put it in their syllabus would be uh, great and amazing. So thank you for that resource. And, and, um, and since you're in DE, uh, if folks want to reach out to you about that textbook, um, the zero cost textbook, they can do that, Christine? Um, I know a little bit about it, but I know Janan Darwish and Angie Misagi were the faculty leads on that. So they are re great resources okay. to reach out to. And if you're interested, they're all in and they want to help you get on zero cost textbooks. Okay, the perfect. sooner the and, better. <laughs> and if I can cut you off here, we have a lot of those textbooks in the library because that's where it started uh, in my office. And we have uh, shown them to a lot of faculty, but they don't want to use them. And that's been the battle. Yeah, I know. I know. But we're starting to see more. Good. I I'm think glad. just because, you know, we are on Canvas. So it's like, ah. <laughs> Right, and, and it's, it's helpful for the students. So if the students also ask the faculty member, hey, I, need, I can't afford these, uh, you, know, you know, if they feel comfortable saying that, I, I really wanna access these free resources. So, cause the power is also on the students to say to the, to the member, instructor, I need, to, I need this because it's, it's gonna help me financially. So thank you, yeah, Christina the Fariba. The program is OpenStax. Okay. Okay, well, you can also reach out to Fariba if you want some more information. It seems like she's very knowledgeable, so I appreciate that. Um, very good. And again, like uh, this was an exercise for us to really think about how as classified professionals, we can use the framework to help our students. This was just so that you can, um, you know, build that equity mindedness muscle. Of course, you'd have to fill every box, but it's just something you could be aware of. So thank you very much, team, team Tony, which is my name. So and that's not me. So but um, <laughs> all right. So um, we got next team five for Amy. You're up. Go ahead, a Team Amy. Um, we were, um, it was Luis Hauregui and Olga Vasquez and myself. Um, Olga doesn't have her microphone and on her computer, so she wasn't able to talk verbally, but we talked a lot via um, chat. Um, Amy's situation, she's a student who is non-traditional in a lot of ways. She's a parent. She is um, specifically working to get her master's degree. She has, um, it indicates that she has some um, past struggles in trying to get through SMC. Um, she has a contingent acceptance to CSUN, um, but she needs to pass the statistics class. She was um, having an, uh, an average of an A in the statistics class before COVID hit, but after COVID hit, obviously the parenting stuff had to happen. Um, you know, um, when she has an eight o'clock statistics class, her um, teacher, I guess, requires that she is not asynchronous, so she has to be in class and lecture at that time, which is the same time her children get up and she has to get her kids together. So there's, um, you know, a lot of, it, it doesn't mention at all um, her cultural or racial um, background, but it's clear that she has, she's a non-traditional student. So um, we were thinking that with regard to authentic communication, that the faculty need to listen to what students' concerns are in their personal lives. Um, understanding that, um, and specifically when a student goes from an A, because um, Amy goes from an A average down to a D plus or C, when you see a student who obviously after COVID is struggling, I th we thought that it was important that the faculty members utilize the GPS system, which is which was formerly known as our early alert system, um, to alert. I work as a student services specialist for the Black Allegiance program, and you know um, my coworker Janet Tercero works for the um, the Adelante program. And so, our if students are, are members of our programs, we automatically get an alert from the GPS system when a faculty member sends flags a student and says the student was doing really great, and all of a sudden they're having issues. And so that system specifically needs to be utilized, I think, more often by faculty members. Um, at the beginning of the semester when students aren't doing well, but also when you notice that students are, obviously they were doing really great at the beginning and then they're, they're struggling um, at one point. Um, maybe the faculty members don't have time to speak specifically to that student, but Tony, you were talking about the idea of um, having a village. 
um, the GPS system allows for that village to happen. Because if a student's a part of, you know, maybe they're uh, like Carla Alvarado, she's with um, the with the disabled student area. If they're in her area, she's going to answer to the student and say, "Hey, we noticed that your English teacher is saying that you're struggling." And likewise, if they're in one of the other, you know, special programs, they get those same notifications. Um, we struggle with cultural humidity, humility because we didn't exactly see what this person's racial background is. But then I thought about cultural um, humi humility coming from the aspect that we have this term that's traditional student, which is usually a student that's not a minority student, or they're not young, or they don't have children, and they don't have all these other struggles. And I figured this falls under the cultural humility, um, being that she's non-traditional because she's a parent. She's not necessarily trying to get a, a transfer or an AA. So I thought that it was important for um, instructors to um, be notified and understand the difference between a traditional student and the obligations of a traditional student and those of a student who is non-traditional. Um, Anti-racist, um, um, that was also difficult because we didn't know her racial background, but Olga had um, brought up the fact that um, we would need to be more ex more flexible in the way that we actually expect students to perform. So this idea that all students will perform at a certain level and they're also going to learn under these circumstances, um, certain students even culturally or racially might learn differently based on their um, their cultural background, um, as with, you know, uh, the, um, what was his name, Pedro, um, that talked about how important it is to actually address the issues in a way that the students will understand based on their personal situation. And then we thought um, also about the change from management and cultural responsible uh, responsive facilitation that students should have access to recorded lectures so that they have uh, the time that they can spend the time that they need specifically on the class when is best for them. That might be at midnight for students who are working or who have, stu who have um, students or kids or whatever. And then knowing that those time tests should be allowed to be taken also in accordance to when that student has access to babysitting or when the child is asleep or you know that kind of thing. So just a lot of this has to do with just understanding that every student is not a traditional student and um, treated them in that way. Great, thank you very much, Jocelyn. Did any of your team members wanna uh, chime in or, or did she drop the mic? I think Jocelyn kind of just dropped the mic. Okay, all right. <laughs> Jocelyn, you get an A plus for today. Yay! <laughs> all right, well, you know what? Um, there is not anybody in the chat who wants to go, so of course, uh, I'm not gonna force anybody to go, and plus we're winding down in time. But I just wanna reiterate, this is just an exercise for us to, how do we utilize the equity framework that is on our equity plan, is on institutional documents of how we are operationalizing equity on our campus? Right. And so, of course, these are the four components that we are thinking about how to do the work. Um, and so as you work with students, as you work with your colleagues, think about the framework, think about those student stories and how you can do these things, because people are like, what is equity? That's a big one. And then they say, so how do we do it? And so this is the framework that we are um, we are using to to answer the question of how. Um, and so this is an exercise you can do for yourself you know, maybe in your division or your department meetings to think about like, what can we do differently? What can we, we, uh, we utilize the framework to really help these students. We got the IR folks from, from Dr. Hannah to tell us, okay, we got some student stories to help us consider what's happening on the ground, especially in COVID-19 with all the distance learning. And so this is just a good exercise for all of you to go back to, refer back to, to really like, to, to, to increase that equity muscle, equity mindedness. So, I hope this was helpful. Thank you, Gina, for saying it was a good exercise. I gave her some money to say that, so I I get I get an A plus myself. Uh, <laughs> but um, but um, but lastly, I just want to um, do this one thing before I turn it over to you, Cyrus. Um, I want to share um, uh, this this here diagram. Well, this image that I created. Um, I don't know if you can see it. Let's see. Okay, so this is just intrapersonal. Uh, classified professionals growth, um, accountability, you can, you can be accountable to your learning, you can smile, self-aware, critical reflection, you can be a lifelong learning, that's cultural humility, and you can do self and community care for your personal, right? And then your, your equity growth in terms of interpersonal, working with other folks, how do you learn in community, empathetically listen to folks, not just hear, but listen, 
go above and beyond. And that's the thing about when I, when I uh, when we did the meditation activity is what, what was that student you thought about? Who was that student to you went above and beyond for that student and that person really appreciated it, right? Lead for equity, right? As you facilitate meetings, as you are in classified professional positions, uh, shared governance or whatever, uh, you can lead for equity. Compassion and creating a systems of support around you because this equity work is hard work and heart work. And we need a village to support each other because there are gonna be some very difficult and challenging conversations that people are gonna be talking about race, talking about institutional racism, systemic oppression. And so we need to have a systems of support for ourselves. Please don't burn out. And then the last one is the institutional, um, is that we need to value this equity work and diversity and inclusion work. Thinking about decision-making process, are classified professionals at the table, not only at the table, but actually making decisions at the table that are respectable? Um, transforming inequitable barriers, welcoming an inclusive environment, creating this in your division, in your department. Um, what is our incentive to be compensated? Because as classified professionals, we are always working in the contractual of our 40 hour work week, but how do we get incentivized and compensated for the extra work that we're doing? Um, because that's what we actually, actually do. Uh, and then um, how do we gain manager and supervisor support? And then how do we embed equity embedded uh, professional development, just as Cyrus and the Professional Development Committee did with this uh, series. Um, so I just want to share this with you. Cyrus will be sending out this Google presentation as something to think about in terms of um, how we can continue to learn. Um, and so what are our next steps in terms of what's happening for me um, is uh, fill out that Santa Monica College Equity Framework Student Stories activity, which you've done or you can do, you can continue to do. Um, and think of ways you would like to try on equity strategies and our activities in your, um, in personally, in your office, in your department, your division. And then uh, lastly, um, because my other colleagues and the other consultants for Ally Path will be doing another series as well. Um, but the one I will be completing is the coaching session. And that's on October 1st. Is that the correct time, Cyrus? I just want to make sure. Is it one to, uh, I believe it's one to two. Um, I think it's uh, 10 to 11, but uh, okay. uh, let me, okay, so I posted um, the website that we're, that this registration page is on, including some of the uh, handouts that we do have. And for those that want to uh, have a deeper dive or a deeper conversation with Tony. We highly encourage uh, those that can to uh, meet with Tony from 10 to 11. Sorry. Okay. I'll change that. So coaching session, 10 <laughs> no to 11. I, I apologize. I, I forgot the, I forgot the zero. And then, yeah, so, it's, it's completely okay. Yeah. So, so what is the coaching session? People are like, what is that? I've never been to a coaching session. What a coaching session is, and it's not mandatory, but basically it's a small group coaching session. And, and, and what we'll do is we'll say, um, Jocelyn will say to me, you know what, I tried this activity on, it didn't really work really well, what do you think? And so as a group and myself, I will give my opinions and my recommendations, um, and then we'll just go around to each person who has, you know what, I tried this equity activity on, but my manager is not feeling me on it, so what do I need to do? So we'll like go deeper into like the, the nuts and bolts of the things that you're trying on or you want to try on, or you're like, I'm thinking about this equity activity I want to do in my area, I don't know how to do it, but I really want to do it. I want to get free um, computers to all our students, but I don't know where to go. So we'll strategize together. So it's very much about a thought partnership, strategic partnership in a group setting. Um, and uh, that'll be October 1st from 10 to 11. And uh, we'll just be in community and just talk more about the nitty gritty and the nuts and bolts of things you want to try on or, you know, even, even navigating power. Um, that's a big thing as well. Uh, uh, so we can talk about that as well and strategizing that way. Um, so please come to that if you feel, uh, if you feel called to that. Um, I will be there definitely um, and we'll have more time for about an hour to discuss more things. Um, but before I turn it over to Cyrus, um, I just want to say from the bottom of my heart, I really appreciate all of you. Uh, I am a classified professional and I know that the classified professionals are the beginning point for our students to um, be successful on our campus. I never stray away from that. I'm always a huge champion for that, that we have not only um, we um, are classified professionals behind a desk, but we are agents of change for these students. And just realize that, that I, I recognize that, and I say that up and down the state as I do these trainings, that um, we are part 
we are the partners that um that need to be uh, folded into this equity work because we definitely have a huge huge contribution to it so i just want to say thank you thank you thank you cyrus for supporting me on this and inviting ally path and the professional development committee but um, i hope this was uh, beneficial and fruitful for all of you as you continue your equity journey and uh, increase your equity muscles um so thank you very much so cyrus Yay. T thank you, Tony. I wish there was like a soundboard where we can just like have a round of applause. You know what? I'm going to unmute everybody for just one second. Everybody can share, share a round of applause with Tony. Thank you, Tony. Tony. Thank you so much. Thank you, Tony. Thank you. Nice to meet you, Tony. Nice to meet all of you. Everybody. Thank you. So, all right. I'm going to mute everybody right now. Okay, so um, as we move forward, thank you, Tony, once again. And so, Tony, we'll miss you. Uh, honestly, like we've all grown to attach uh, to to atta an attachment to you through these sessions. Seriously. Um, yeah, honestly, I was so driving and listening. Oh, well, <laughs> I, I, I'll miss you too. And I, I'm just I'm just an email away. So, um, yeah. Cyrus has my information. You can always contact me. I'm always down to help and support. You just let me know how I can do that, and I I will be there. Yes, absolutely. And so, um, yeah, so our next, uh, our next sequence of workshops will actually be somebody from the Allied Path family. It'll be Justin Campbell. Uh, he'll, he'll be a different speaker on a, a, a slightly different um, uh, a topic within, within, um, within our equity series. So if you look back a, a, little, a little bit, a scroll up onto the uh, Classified Professional Development Workshops training pa uh, page, uh, certainly um, that's those are the next few workshops that we do have within this series and you can see uh and uh that uh justin um sorry i'll just actually screen share um you you'll see that uh justin's uh justin campbell's uh next workshops are in october and uh 13th and the 21st so uh hopefully we'll see you we'll, we'll see you in those sessions and um, i highly encourage everybody to uh take advantage of the drop-in uh coaching sessions it's one-on-one -on -one time that well, we've specifically built for you to kind of think out loud uh think big Think beautifully about um, all all of our uh, e equity uh, initiatives uh, with Tony. So I think that'll be a really great way to give your thoughts life uh, uh, as we continue to work through our uh, um, various equity uh, initiatives. And so uh, thank you all so much. Uh, once this recording is uh, done, uh, it'll be rendered, captioned, and then um, uh, we'll send out uh, all the links. <laughs> All the all the captured videos out to everybody who's attended. So, thank you all so much, and uh, we'll see you all next time. Bye bye. Thank you. Appreciate all of you. Bye everybody. <laughs> bye Tony. Thank you very much. You were awesome. Thank you, Fariba. I'm glad you're safe. That you didn't crash in the car. <laughs> I think we're he all glad about shut that. Me down. Yeah. I can't believe Cyrus shut me down. <laughs> maybe free, maybe because Cyrus recorded. knows how you drive. Maybe because Cyrus knows you how you know drive. You know what? I Skype with my mom every morning. 